that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. We're going to talk to with uh, C. Wallman. He is a published author. He's a political commentator. He is an activist. Provide insight into the Israel-Palestinian conflict and just to carry it out against Muslims in general. Tell us why this jihad to, to, to tell the Muslim story in a, Western, in a hostile uh, hostile environment in the most West, uh, Western uh, world, Western culture, and Western audience. This is a losing cause, man. I've been trying to do, <laughs> I've been trying to do this for a long time. As well. Thanks, sir. Uh, thanks for having me on, Ahmed. Um, I, you know, I guess the place to start is, you know, as we we're talking, discussing off air, I, I lived in Indonesia for 10 years um, from the early 2000s to around about 2012. Um, in 2005, I witnessed a Jamar Islamaya, which is an offshoot of Al-Qaeda, uh, a terrorist attack. Two suicide bombers blew themselves up on a, a beach on Jimbaran, which is pretty much near the airport. My friends and I were having dinner at the time. Uh, we were pretty much the first responders uh, on the beach that day. We had to sort through the, the wounded from the dead, and we had to pull the wounded and the alive uh, up from the beach up onto the road, onto these makeshift gurneys. And... Uh, that was, you know, a, a huge turning point for me in my life. Up until that point, uh, I'd always been a non-believer, agnostic, atheist, whatever label you want to put on it. Uh, but I really didn't care about my non-belief. I didn't wear my atheism or my agnosticism on my sleeve. I just didn't believe. I just didn't believe in a higher power. I didn't believe the stories of the Bible. Um, and when that terrorist attack happened and I, and I witnessed that, I sort of became obsessed with religion um, and in particular I became obsessed with Islam and I became what you would call a rabid new atheist. Uh, I wrote a book called God Hates You, Hate Him Back, which was published in 2009. And I wrote that book from the benefit of myself to try and address the feelings I was having about that night in 2005, what would, could compel two guys to strap explosives to themselves, detonate themselves and taking up innocent women and children with them. And the only answer I could come up with, well it, well, it had to be religion and it had to be Islam, which uh, which drove them to do that. Um, I sent, From that point on, I became, the book did well in the US, which sort of gave me a platform here, and, and I did a lot of book tours and so forth uh, here. Um, but then I started studying t uh, terrorism as an amateur. Uh, I now have a degree in terrorism, doing my master's in, in counterterrorism. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a growing, it's a growing academic discipline. I, I used to be a discipline confined only to uh, military schools. Now it's in academia. And um, and I, I quickly realized that my thesis was wrong. It's not Islam that drives these terrorists uh, to do that. It's, it's a whole, it's an array of complex socio-psychological uh, um, um, factors, which are too long to go into right now. But the point is, I was wrong. It wasn't religion that drove uh, extremists to do this. It wasn't uh, uh, religion that's driving our qaeda It's not religion, really, that's driving even... Uh, ISIS, uh, you have power, you have personal so uh, socio-psychological dynamics. But I realized I'd been a bigot in those years after the bomb. I realized I'd become an anti-Muslim bigot, an atheist extremist. I, you know, you, you could liken my, the way I used to think, similar to someone like Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens wow. or, or Sam Harris. I was that bad, yes. <laughs> so... Wow. Yeah, I was uh, I was atrocious. So, uh, but I realized I was wrong, and you know, around about two thousand eight, two thousand nine, uh, had an epiphany. Realized I've been a, a, an anti-Muslim big, and I've been trying to right those wrongs ever since. And come to realize that wherever you find Muslims, actually, you find people that are ever being oppressed, occupied, vilified, discriminated against. Um, and you know, if you look at the world, the great majority of the world's stateless people are Muslim, from the Rohingya to the, uh, the Kurds to the Kashmiri. Um, and, you know, the Palestinians, of course. So, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's almost impossible to look at the world today and not see that the lion's share of, of injustice uh, on a global scale is not occurring against Muslim populations. Uh, most of the violence is committed by non-Muslims, but the perception is the opposite. Uh, why the Palestinian story hasn't been told uh, yeah. in, in the Western media, especially here in the United States? 
Yeah, the post, I mean, it's been an orchestrated attempt to silence Palestinian voices in the Western media. Um, and the Israel lobby have been very effective at doing that. They started it um, in, in the 1970s, uh, going after university students in campuses, uh, attacking pro-Palestinian groups. Um, and also, too, I mean, not just at that level, but also at the academic level uh, and the policy level, They've tried, from the 1970s, Israel, Israel uh, realised if they can conflate Palestinian cause or the Palestinian liberation cause with Islamism or Islamic terrorism, rather than being what it really is, a liberation movement or a resistance against a violent occupation, then American and Western uh, audiences would become sympathetic to the Israel cause. They would come to identify with Israel. They would see in themselves a white settler colonial state which is surrounded by you know, brutish, backward, barbaric, you know, indigenous population, and Israel has to do what it needs to defend itself and will become some sympathetic to that narrative. If you're an Australian, uh, you can identify with that because Australia is a white settler colonial country that was, you know, that ethnically cleansed and carried out a genocide against its indigenous people, as was the United States. And those both countries have implemented an array of different, you know, uh, structural systemic measures to suppress and keep down their respective indigenous populations. Um, and that's what's happening in Israel. And so it's very easy for, you know, the Western, particularly white settler colonial states like Australia and the United States to identify uh, with that. I know, uh, you know, you you have a lot of respect and love to Thomas Friedman. He <laughs> was lately uh, an interview, and I think on CNN or Fox, one of those, and he's uh, you know, after the, the, the Trump declaration, it's almost like Balfour declaration <laughs> you know, of, yeah. of Jerusalem, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, from someone who doesn't uh, own it for, for for those who doesn't deserve it, a promise. But uh, he would say uh, the question was from the media, would the Palestinian use violence? And exactly, the Western media is very guilty of doing that. They they ignore the Palestinian cause. They ignore Israel's systemic and structural violence against the Palestinians, which happens around the clock, every single day of every single month of every single year. And then when the Palestinians respond, uh, whether it's throwing rocks at tanks, whether it's throwing rocks at Israeli soldiers, well, then that makes the Western news. And so the, uh, the Western media portrays to Western audiences that Palestinian violence happens in a vacuum. And they don't see the cause related to that. And, you know, we see that in Gaza. So when you know, in 2014, when um, Israel carried out its um, uh, uh, siege on Gaza over the course of 51 days, killing 2,200 Palestinian civilians, uh, that was the first time a lot of Western audiences even heard of Gaza um, or had seen it. And but they were only, only told that Israel was responding to Hamas rockets. Well, I've been to Gaza. I've seen Hamas rockets, and they're nothing more than glorified you know, uh, fireworks you see on July 4th, <laughs> that are most of home made out of aluminium um, yeah, yeah. tubes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so you know, we don't see, the Western media doesn't get to see that 2 million Palestinians in Gaza live in what is the world's largest concentration camp. It really is an open-air prison where, you know, youth unemployment is at 75%. There's open sewage. There's only two hours electricity per day in the middle of winter, in the middle of summer. Hospitals don't function. People who need urgent medical leave. If you have cancer, Israel makes you have a 70-day seven, waiting list uh, before you can exit what is a, an open-air prison. So um, that daily violence, uh, the daily oppression, the, the military checkpoints, if you live in the West Bank and you have a permit to work in Israel or where the jobs are, you have to navigate these military checkpoints, which take up to six hours of your day. Can you imagine having to do a normal eight-hour working day on top of another six hours of standing in line at three o'clock in the morning? to get to your place of work. I mean, it's it's humiliating, it's oppressive, and we don't get to see that day-to-day -day violence. Do you see some analogy between the dehumanization uh, of Arabs and Muslims uh, to the level what the, the American and the white system have done with the blacks to kind of give a free pass for killing, lynching them, and all of this? It seems like... Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean... You know, for white people, I don't know, it must be something in the, the, the white settler colonial DNA. If you're from a white settler colonial country, you are terrified at your core of anybody who isn't white. <laughs> because yeah. you must sense uh, that one day that the indigenous <laughs> people are going to rise up and kick because, you out. Because you know what you've done to them, you never trust them. I think yeah, exactly. Coming, yeah, that, that, you know, I think we think subconsciously that one day they're going to seek their revenge. <laughs> it's very normal, very human. I, I, I yeah. just, uh, 
I know you talked about how they transform a political conflict to a religious conflict, and I, you know, I'm sure you you heard about Oliver Roy, you know, the soci French sociologist, and I think uh, he he had it on the head. One of the few Western uh, philosopher and uh, thinker, he said, this is not, uh, you know, uh, Muslim or Islamic terrorism or Islamic radical. He said that. That this is about the Islamization of radicalism. Exactly, and I mean, it is, I mean, that's part of Israel's strategy to portray it as a religious conflict, because they know that Westerners, being a you know Christian majority Western countries, will come to identify more with uh, uh, the Jewish religion and people of the Jewish faith than faith, and they will with a foreign exotic faith like Islam. Uh, but if if Israel allows the West to see what the conflict really is a political conflict, a white settler colonial uh, state ethnically cleansing and carrying out a genocide against the Palestinian people, um, well, then all of a sudden Israel might have a problem because the West might come to sympathize with the truly oppressed people and therefore you don't have an Israeli state anymore. I think it would be a disaster if we get God out of the real estate business, you know, <laughs> and I think uh, we can see the reality there. Well, that, that, that's the irony, you know, uh, God was in the real estate business when Israel, the state of Israel was formed, but a lot of these uh, founders of the Israeli state uh, were atheists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All this military destruction uh, of the of the city uh, of Gaza or, or uh, Lebanon or some or elsewhere, but uh, we don't see the reality and the violence committed by the settler and this is something new to me about this uh, the dogs of war. Can you, yeah. can you tell us a little bit what's going on there? Yeah, so, so in, the, the, in 1967, um, you had the Arab-Israeli uh, uh, war. Uh, in Israel, illegally seized you know, the Golan Heights, West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza, uh, which is a war crime under the Geneva Convention, which is a violation of international law. And from that point on, they've colonized the West Bank. Uh, so... When they initially colonized, it was maybe 5,000 settlers, you know, in the early 1970s, which became 20,000 settlers. And today, 50 years later, you have, you know, almost three quarters of a million illegal settlers in the West Bank. Uh, when you go to the West Bank, you see these Israeli settlements. I mean, some of these settlements um, are the size of small cities. They have swimming, Olympic-sized swimming pools, shopping malls, schools, um, you name lakes even. I mean, uh, they're massive. These are massive enterprises. Um, but if not every, you know, obviously these settler settlements don't start out this size. They start out as little outposts. So when you when you go through the West Bank, you see these massive settlements which hold maybe 25, 50,000 people. But then you see uh, all the way down to these settler outposts, which might be 50 caravans. And in those 50 caravans, um, you obviously have these. These are the hardcore. They usually, when you go to these outposts, they have American you accents. You, you visited those settlers. <laughs> yes, yeah, I've, I've visited many of these outposts. Um, and so, uh, this one outpost I described in that, that piece from the Middle East side, um, you'll have a, a, a heavily armed checkpoint uh, with you know uh, Jewish settlers with uh, automatic, you know, semi-automatic uh, uh, weaponry. Um, American accents, uh, so that you know Brooklyn accents, and <laughs> they're certainly not Palestinian. They only just arrived here a year or two ago. Uh, and this and is so an argument. I know you're going to finish, but this is when I was talking about uh, the you know, American who went and fought with ISIS. We never fought about the American who go and fought with the Jewish state. You know, even illegally yeah. with some yeah, of the be. some of the groups that that the uh, State Department think they are terrorist groups. And the JSOL, the Jewish state in Levant. Yeah, yeah that's exactly <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah, they, so when they set up these outposts, they put some caravans on there, um, and they have to provide their own security because they're illegal outposts. Even Israeli uh, government deems these outposts illegal, but they'll still allow them to flourish and allow them to grow. But you have to provide for your own security. And so what they do, I remember the first time I saw one of these outposts, he's standing on a hill, and there's these wooden boxes, crates every 50 yards, and ch uh, and chains in between each box. And when you look closely, you can see these dogs, maybe two to three dogs are tied to each box, and you've got another 50 yards chains, another box, another two to three dogs. And these dogs are chained 24-7 um, to these boxes. So anytime a Palestinian farmer or a Palestinian gets close to the outpost, the dogs start barking, and then the settlers run from their caravans with their guns and shoot whatever Palestinian happened to be there. A lot of these Palestinians that were caught in this settler violence were kids that were kicking a soccer ball, and the soccer ball went too far. Um, they're either attacked by the dogs, and if they're not attacked by the dogs, 
they're, they're often and sometimes shocked by um, by their settlements. It's uh, uh, to see the brutality of the colonization of the West Bank uh, firsthand is it, it really is something else. Uh, well, let's uh, end this with some you know a tragedy here that happened to Ibrahim Abu Thraya, and this guy lost his legs. Uh, and another, he's an activist. He goes and raises a flag in the front, whatever. And he lost his legs of one of the explosion. One of he was uh, killed yesterday by a sniper. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy, you can see in the picture, uh, you know, his legs are amputated, and he's holding the flag, and he still got killed. So, yeah, even expressing your uh, <coughs> grievance peacefully doesn't save you doesn't uh, does so what uh, what option do they have exactly it's like um, it's the same you know for black americans um when when black americans get to the point where they can't take the structural racism and the, the structural injustice against them that the criminal justice system is stacked against them when they can't take it anymore and they explode and you, like they did in ferguson and you had the riots or the riots in baltimore uh then they're criticized for uh, going too far and then when they take a knee during a national anthem, then they're also criticized. So you can't have violence and you can't, you know, protest peacefully if you're a minority in this country. Well, it's the same thing in Palestine. Uh, and so the Palestinians come for rocks. Obviously, they can't carry out acts of violence. But even with video clips, which have been, uh, I've shared just in the last 24, 48 hours, Palestinian protesters just holding a Palestinian flag uh, at the Damascus gate, gate to the old city, which is in East Jerusalem, which is Palestinian territory by international law, Israeli border police coming along, not only taking their flags, but brutally giving these kids a beating. Uh, I mean, if you can't even hold a flag as a form of protest, I mean, no protest is allowed. You really, Israel does force you to either accept the occupation or go into a cage. You know, this issue now uh, boiled down to power. You know, you, we can talk about the promised land and God's getting in the real estate business. We can talk about the history of the Palestinian. But, uh, w- you know, when we look at the state of the Arabs right now, in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Jordan and wherever, so yeah. how that part is playing out in all this dynamic of uh, that last latest decision of Trump, uh, you know, yeah. and that decision well, that the Americans to, postponed yeah. for a long time. To put it, to put it, I guess, as an analogy, I mean, the Palestinians have just been abandoned by everyone, including the Arab states, and long ago. Um, and this story is always interesting, and I tell it quite often. Um, when Obama was first sworn in as president in January of 2009, uh, his first trip was to the Middle East. Uh, one of his first trips was obviously with, uh, with King Solomon, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And so Obama and his team had prepared hours and hours of briefings on the Palestinian issue uh, because they believed that the Palestine was going to be the issue that Saudi Arabian king would want to speak about most. And so uh, as soon as they sat down and started to speak about Palestine, uh, the King Simon cut him short, no interest in talking about it, just wanted to speak about Iran. What are you going to do about Iran? Uh, was his, his response to Obama. And so as uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the, the the other you know the Gulf states are obsessed with Iran right now, uh, which means Palestinian issue has long been forgotten. I mean, uh, M, you know, MBS um, uh, wouldn't even put out a more than a, a some sort of weak condemnation of Trump's move on Jerusalem. Um, at the end of the day, Saudi Arabia sees Israel as a as a useful ally in its fight against Iran, um, and as do the other Arab Gulf states. Uh, Sid Wallman is a journalist, published author, political commentator, and also you have a comments in your uh, Middle East Eye, which is, we always follow, and uh, and uh, he is interested in, uh, in, in addressing the Israel-Palestinian conflict. One of the few journalists, and uh, actually you are an activist journalist, which that you differentiate yourself than the other uh, journalists that they just go and write a story. And uh, it's talking about uh, the uh, the latest uh, event and uh, the the state of uh, the Palestinians uh, in, in uh, Western uh, media, in uh, Western eyes, 
uh, you know, uh, after the, uh, the, uh, the declaration, uh, Jerusalem declaration by Trump. Oh. Appreciate your time and thank you so much. Thanks, Amir. Great to uh, finally get a chance to speak with you. Yeah, thank you.